I was working as a park ranger in Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. It was one of my childhood dreams to live in the forest and protect nature. I was a pretty idealistic kid. When I was little, I used to love the Smokey the Bear commercials on TV. They were my favorite, and he was my hero for some reason. So I was living my dream. I really loved it all. I spent a lot of my time just patrolling the trails and making sure everything was in good order. And there was a surprising amount of search and rescue missions, too. I was amazed at how unprepared some people were when they decided to spend time in the woods. I did plenty of brush clearing and removing fallen trees. That's how I ended up in this situation. I was almost done with my patrol one evening when I spotted a tree that seemed to be halfway sawn through. Whoever had been camping there apparently thought it was okay to cut down whole trees. I couldn't believe it, and how they chose that one to cut was beyond me. It was in a really awkward place on the side of the hill with a ton of brush under it. It looked really precarious like it could fall at any time. I was walking back to the ATV to get my chainsaw. Then across the road through the trees, I saw what looked to be large saplings stacked together in kind of a teepee shape. There were two of those structures that I could see through the woods, and it was just really irritating me to think that these campers felt free to take down those young trees. I got my chainsaw out of the ATV and went back to do my cutting. When I got back to the tree, I saw that it wasn't a saw that had been used on it. It looked like something had pushed it until it started to splinter, which didn't seem possible. Unless you used like a heavy-duty truck or something, but a truck couldn't reach that spot. I was ready to take it down when I heard a tree limb snap. Before I could even turn around, I was pinned under this huge branch. It had landed across my thighs and one of my arms. I was pinned down there with the rest of the tree threatening to fall any minute. It was freaking unbelievable. I was so grateful that I was able to reach my radio and call in for help. I was trapped, but I wasn't in terrible pain. I could wiggle my fingers and it didn't feel like anything was broken. It had grazed my head on the way down, though, so I was bleeding. I felt like a real fool for getting myself in that position. It was starting to get dark, and I was getting really uncomfortable. I lay there for close to an hour before the rescue truck got to me. It wasn't hard for two people to get the branch off me. I was able to move everything fine, and I didn't feel too bad considering. I felt okay to walk even though I was pretty stiff and limping a little. It was protocol that I be taken in for observation, though. There was no major hospital close by, but there was this old rural clinic in the area, so that's where they took me. It was dark by then, but I remember the moon was almost full because everything was still pretty visible. When we got there, the place looked more like an old house than anything. We were surprised to see a big military truck parked out in front. You know the kind you see in a convoy on the highway? There were soldiers doing something in the back. We went up a ramp to the entrance, but we were confronted by a guard in a combat uniform holding some kind of rifle. He told us there was no access through there. We explained my situation, but he said we would have to go to one of the outbuildings and he would let someone know we were there. We turned around to go back down the ramp. Then all of a sudden there was a bunch of shouting coming from the soldiers by the truck. They're shouting, clamp it down tighter, don't let it go and they're obviously struggling with something inside of the truck. And then I heard the loudest, wildest yelp come out of the back of the truck. Primal. Like a primal kind of scream. I limped down to the end of the ramp and was hit by this really horrible stench. The yelping went on and on and I just felt heartsick for whatever it was, but also terrified. Me and the guys with me just stood there. We felt paralyzed by this bizarre situation. Then the front door of the clinic bursts open and someone in a white coat came flying down the ramp holding something in one hand. The guard at the door yelled at us to get out of there and go to the other building. We were heading away but we kept looking behind us and the white coat guy was being helped up to reach in the truck and then in a couple minutes everything got quiet. We reached the door of the outbuilding and just stood there watching. They were letting down the tailgate and then all of them together pulled out what looked like a giant stretcher. Something huge was under a sheet, but when they were jostling it down, something like a big hairy foot got uncovered. I couldn't tell the color, but it was huge and it was hairy. 
but the toes looked almost human. The guard opened the entrance door and they carried it inside. That's all I know. There's nothing about that night that I can explain. A lot of my extended family live in the Atchafalaya Basin. Far back as we can figure, they've been shrimping, crabbing, and crawfishing these parts, and I loved helping when I visited. I would also get to live on a houseboat that got power from a generator when visiting. Ever since I can remember, I've been hearing stories about the Loop Guru. I think it's the same thing other people call Dog Man. The Loop Guru mostly goes after kids who are bad, so I always thought it was just a story people made up to keep kids in line. Now I'm not so sure about that. See, my brother Jim and I got a shrimp boat, and we go out from before the sun rises until after the sun sets during brown shrimp season. You gotta get them during those few weeks because after that, they're gone for the year. The rest of the year we can get crabs and crawfish, but we make most of our money from the shrimp. It's a lot of work tossing that net out of the boat, hauling it back in, and getting the shrimp out of it. I don't pay a lot of attention to what's out there in the swamp. But every once in a while, late at night, we'll hear a howl and Jim will say, That's the Loop Guru. I never believe him, but I also can't explain the noise because it doesn't sound like a dog or wolf or coyote. I never thought about it too much until we started bringing Timmy along. Timmy is Jim's kid. He's 11, but he caught on quick to sorting out the shrimp we keep from all the other stuff that gets caught in the net. Turtles, fish, whatever. I heard the howl more often when Timmy started joining us. Jim stopped saying, that's the Loop Guru, probably so he wouldn't scare the kid. Maybe that made me even notice it more. I started ignoring it because we were hearing that howl every night. It sounds weirdly human. It was creepy, but I guess I got used to it. Besides, we were busy, like I said, hauling in the nets. One late afternoon, though, we passed by a small piece of marshy land, and I saw something standing on it like near the water. I thought it was a person, but it had weird curved legs. Then it threw back its head. First, I noticed the long dog-like snout. Then I heard that howl. Jim was driving the boat and he must have heard it over the engine because he turned in the other direction as fast as he could, which wasn't that fast. I had plenty of time to see the thing lower its head and stare at us with its red, demonic eyes. I felt like it was looking at Timmy, he behind me. I hoped he didn't notice the thing. But I guess he did because he looked scared too. We were headed toward another shrimping spot, and when we got there, we all started working like nothing happened. Jim took a different route back when we finished for the night. We wouldn't never pass by that spot again if we could help it. But then, on the way back, I saw it again. Its fur looked all silver in the full moon. I didn't even think about there being a full moon right then. It almost looked like the moon was a spotlight trained on it, I could see everything, big muscles under thick fur, pointy dog-like ears. I'm pretty sure it was taller than a person too, maybe eight feet high judging by the trees near it. So that was scary enough, but then it showed its teeth. They glinted like swords in the moonlight. They were huge. I could imagine the hole they'd make in a person. Jim turned the boat again, but just as he did, the thing leaped into the air and sailed toward us. It was a long jump, maybe ten feet. I thought there was no way it'd make it to our boat. You can guess I wouldn't be telling this if it didn't make it. It did, just barely. It slammed into the side of the boat with its front legs gripping the side and back legs dangling below. I stood there frozen, watching it try to scramble up. I think my brain just wouldn't process what was going on. But I finally cottoned on to that if I didn't move quick, the thing would be up on the deck attacking us. Besides. I was pretty sure it was after Timmy. I had to stop it from getting him. I ran over to the deck and started kicking at its front legs. It snarled at me and pulled its head up, trying to bite my feet. All this time, Jim was driving the boat as fast as it would go, which really isn't that fast. Plus, he had to watch out not to ground the boat. In this marsh, land can kind of sneak up on you. Even though we weren't going that fast, though, that thing must have been real strong to hang on while we were moving. I had on thick rubber shrimp boots, but one of those teeth caught and made a hole in it. Later on, when I doubted what really happened, 
I looked at the hole in those boots and I knew it was real. After it made the hole, I used the bottom of the boot to kick harder, right into its face. It tried to bite the boot again, but the bottom was too hard. It couldn't get a grip. I managed to pull my foot back and kick again. This time I must have somehow gotten in exactly the right spot because it fell back into the water. I didn't see it come back up, but I think it probably did. I reckon at some point I'll see it again. I got a feeling it's not gone forever. I've always been a loner. It's probably mostly out of habit as I had a lot of illnesses as a kid, so I never really got to have a normal childhood with friends and stuff. Instead, I spent a lot of time in a hospital bed and a lot more time dreaming about being part of a group like the characters from my favorite TV shows. I started getting better as I got older. By my late teens, I barely had any major hospital stays. But I was still homeschooled because my parents and doctors didn't want to put too much stress on my immune system right away. Maybe that's why I really wanted to go to college. Not just online, I wanted the whole thing. Doom rooms, cafeteria food, walking to class. All of it. I guess I wanted to make up for lost time. When I first started, I was really nervous. I didn't really know how to interact with people who weren't wearing scrubs except for what I'd learned from watching TV. Turns out I didn't have to worry so much. I met a super nice group, James, Rosalie, Sarah, and Joe. We shared some interests, and they were really cool despite my awkwardness. I really wanted to make a good impression on them so that I could become an official member of the friend group. I was hoping for an opportunity to do some sort of group activity so I could bond with everyone. I got my chance when they invited me on a camping trip. We would all carpool to the campsite, which wasn't too far away. Then we would spend a long weekend hanging out and sleeping under the stars. When we got to the campsite, they taught me how to set up the tents and cook camping food. We roasted marshmallows and sang campfire songs and stargazed and told scary stories. It was just like on TV, only better, because it was real. Unfortunately, not all the evening was great. There were other groups camping in the sites around us and one of them was really rude. I don't know what school they went to, but they were college kids like us. They partied very loudly through half of the night. James went over to talk to them, then Sarah. It wasn't just us either. A few of the other groups camping in the area tried to talk to them. They wouldn't listen. It wasn't a huge deal in the grand scheme of things, but we were all annoyed that they were being so inconsiderate. So we decided to teach them a little lesson. When we were telling scary stories the first night, we found out that Joe could do some disturbingly convincing creepy monster noises. We decided to use that to freak out the rude campers by making them think there was a real monster. Joe went into the car so nobody nearby would hear and recorded several audio clips of various monster noises. He connected his phone to Sarah's Bluetooth speaker, which we then hid near the other campsite. Then we found a hiding place further away where we could see the results of our prank without them seeing us. Joe started playing the clips and it was so funny. He started with a low growl noise. The rude campers were playing music and they stopped and turned it down so they could hear better. Then Joe pressed play again and they looked at each other all nervous. We all had to bite our hands to keep quiet. We could hear the rude campers asking each other if they heard a sound. Joe kept them on edge with some ominous hissing and growling sounds for a couple minutes. Finally, Rosalie grabbed the phone, turned the volume way up, and blasted them with a screeching roar. They all went ballistic. Everyone ran around screaming, grabbing their stuff, and running into their trailer. My friends and I were all laughing so hard as we ran away. We were walking along this kind of hill area, where the ground sort of dropped off with a moderate slope. At the bottom of the hill, it got flat again, and the trees resumed. From where we were, we could see out over the lower area and into the trees. There was a denser patch of trees between us and the rude campers, so we felt comfortable having our flashlights on. We were all whispering and giggling about the prank we just pulled, and we were generally in very high spirits. But then James made a gesture which made his flashlight beam shine into the forest at the base of the slope. I just remember a flash of red eyes and a large, dark shape. We all froze, except Joe. 
I guess he was more adventurous, or maybe he just didn't believe he'd seen what he'd seen. He slowly moved his light back to where we saw the shape. I'd be willing to bet that everyone else was thinking exactly what I was thinking, that Joe had just gotten all of us killed. Because there was something there. I saw a dark, hulking body, definitely not human-shaped. The shoulders were too broad and looked misshapen. It didn't seem to have much of a head either, just a lump on its shoulders with those huge red eyes. We didn't move. It didn't move. It just stared straight at us. Suddenly, part of what I thought were misshapen shoulders shot out sideways. They were huge wings, way bigger than even the biggest birds. And I guess they weren't for show because whatever the thing was crouched down and then shot straight up into the air like it was launched from a cannon. We all looked up, but somehow it had already disappeared into the night sky. I don't think any of us slept the rest of that night. I don't know about the others, but I was waiting for the thing from the forest to come back. I didn't know what I thought it would do, but I didn't want to find out. But whatever it was, it never came back. As soon as it was light, we packed up and went back to school, and we all agreed never to talk about what had happened again. I had hoped that my first camping trip with my new friends would be an experience to remember, but I hadn't counted on living through a real-life episode of Scooby-Doo. Maybe the hospital was safer after all. Years ago, when I was only 20, I did the stupidest thing ever. I was driving back to my college in Massachusetts and had left later in the evening right around sunset. It was about a two-hour drive and at the time my radio wasn't working so I was dreading the quiet ride back. I had been driving for no longer than 20 minutes when I saw a lady on the side of the road nearly get run over by the car in front of me. Something told me to stop and see if she needed help. I pulled over and got out, approaching her slowly. I asked her if everything was all right and if she needed a ride somewhere. She nodded before she got into the passenger side. In a sense, I was glad to have company on the drive so I wouldn't be bored out of my mind. I glanced around before getting into my car and driving off. We made small talk and along the way she started to open up and conversate with me. Right away I noticed she had some type of accent like she wasn't from the area. In the midst of picking her up in the dark, I didn't realize the clothes she had on. It seemed like an undergarment dress like people back in the days wore. I commented on it in a joking manner and said, You must work somewhere you have to dress up like old times, huh? She gave me a puzzled look before turning her eyes back to the road. I shrugged it off, thinking she may have just been tired or didn't want to crack a joke with a stranger. I pointed to my radio and apologized for it being broken since we couldn't listen to music. I saw her out of the corner of my eyes mouthing something and the radio miraculously turned on. I gasped excitedly, Wow, thanks you got it to work. She frowned and tilted her head and said, This thing is a radio, you said? I nodded and she inspected it further, like it was the first time she ever saw one. You've never seen one before, have you? I asked. She shook her head and stated, I've only heard music played at church. Based on her clothes and her story, I started to suspect maybe she was Amish since I know they do things the olden way. Well, have at it. You can use this dial to search different stations for music. I instructed her how to do so, and for some reason all we got was static. Sorry about that, I guess it's still broken, I said. Down the road I could see light from a distance, and as we approached it grew clearer. A man with a torch lit up was standing in the middle of the road. I thought to myself, what in the world is this guy doing that's dangerous? I slowed down and stopped the car a good 100 feet in front of him. I looked at the lady and her face turned pale white. It went without saying this had to be the guy she was running from. My eyes stayed locked on him and I whispered to her, I'll quickly drive around and pass him, but it could get bumpy. She took a deep breath and sighed. No, it's okay, I need to face this, she said. She got out of the car and walked towards him. I rolled my window down just enough so I could hear them. All of a sudden, I hear her blurt out, I've done nothing wrong, thou hast no reason to suspect thy as a witch. She flung her arms in the air, yelling with all her might. The stern man blurted back, Thine has practiced the art and witnesses hath not denied. You will be burned at the stake, witch. 
I slumped in my seat and wanted to peel off, but I couldn't just leave her there. So much was going through my mind. Was she in fact Amish? And why is he throwing around the term witch? I was too busy paying attention to them to notice the mob of men with torches walking from behind my car. By the time I noticed them, it was far too late to drive off without running any of them over. So instead, I ran to the lady's side. Confused about their exchange, but certain of the danger, I took her hand and ran into the forest. It was like my flight or fight kicked in and we both ran for what seemed like a good ten minutes. We both ducked behind a sturdy tree and looked to see if they followed. We didn't hear or see anything, so we caught our breaths. She could tell by the look on my face I knew something about this whole thing was off. If I told you I was a witch, would you fear me? She asked. I paused, still trying to catch my breath. You haven't shown me you're a threat, so no, I responded. If you're a witch, it's safe to say you're not from these times, are you? I asked. She grew quiet and nodded. I'm not living nor dead. Salem was once my home, but it was all taken from me, she said. She went on to say how she was a witch, but not evil. The man we saw on the road was who she was set to marry, but she refused his hand in marriage. Out of spite, he spread false news of her malicious intentions when she had none. I could hear the pain in her voice as she welled up. She told me the worst part of it all was that she secretly had a child with a man she truly loved. She wasn't able to get any closure on his whereabouts or what came of them. I expressed my condolences and asked her name. She told me it was Elizabeth Stanton, and her lover's name was Randolph Locklear. I chuckled, what a coincidence my last name is Locklear. My smile faded, and we locked eyes. She leaned in closer, examining my face. Yes. Yes, of course your features are distinct, she said, turning my chin. My descendant, she cried out happily before vanishing into thin air. I gasped, falling back. Had I really just seen that? I made my way back to my car, which was still sitting in the middle of the road. There was no sign of anyone, so I sat back in my car. I was still trying to process everything that happened. I was trying to snap out of it, so I turned the radio on. It caught on to a channel and started playing music. When I returned to my college a few hours later, I attempted to search for her and her lover's name, but I couldn't find anything. To this day, I haven't told anyone, but I believe Elizabeth really is my ancestor. It was like we were connected in those final moments, and I think she's at peace now. I was a fur trapper who used to trap in the Arctic around 40 years ago. There are very strange things happening in the Arctic. Maybe that's because it's so hard to get to and so cold. I spent over 10 years collecting fur in the Arctic, and here are just some of the strangest things I saw in my time there. A polar bear cut in half, in the middle of a snowy plain. We weren't close to the ocean, so no walrus or anything that could potentially saw a polar bear in half could have done it. The bear had no organs, but everything else was intact. The thing that had killed the polar bear only ate its internal organs and left. Over the next 10 years, I found around seven more polar bear carcasses split in half just like the first. I swear the Arctic has its own ghosts, or some sort of shadow people. Often at night, me and a few other guys consisting of researchers and other trappers that were staying at the camp, I was reported back hearing sounds of people singing in an unknown language, faint drums, and children's laughter. When I finally asked the cook who had been working up in the Arctic longer than, he smirked at me and said, You people couldn't understand. I would also find my things misplaced often. I am by no means a forgetful person. To be a fur trapper, you must be aware of where you put things, like your very sharp blades and dangerous traps, lest you end up maiming yourself. I also was 100% confident it wasn't my age causing me to forget where I kept my things, because I would find my misplaced items in places where I would never, ever keep them. One time, my toothbrush was in my pillowcase. Another, I found my favorite pair of socks two miles away from my camp. I chalked it up to some animal that wasn't as afraid of humans as it should be, but the lack of animal evidence, bite marks, fur, saliva. One year, while watching the Northern Lights, I saw an aircraft in the far distance descend until they were around 50 feet above the snowy dunes. 
The small plane dropped a few very large wooden boxes and swiftly took off. I thought about what I had seen all night that night, and in the morning I set out to quench my curiosity. It had seemed whatever was in those boxes was alive because there was an insane amount of fresh blood in the snow surrounding the boxes. It had seemed that the carnivores of the Arctic had beat me because there wasn't anything left to see except wooden splinters and chunks of flesh. I did, however, see one large chunk of flesh the size of my torso with shimmering green scales on it. During my fifth year, my buddy Ray caught something real strange while fishing. It had seven eyes, they looked a little too human-like for my taste, that it used to stare at us balefully. In its stomach, we found an entire human hand. The researchers Ray and I brought it up to seemed perplexed. I genuinely doubt those nerds knew anything about it. I would often catch small cryptid creatures in my traps. They looked like tiny babies, except with huge heads with beady black eyes that suggested animal-like intelligence. They were also pale to the point of being gray or sometimes even blue. The first time I came across one, I was beside myself with fear. I was convinced aliens were going to take over the planet in the following day, but it never happened. The other guys at camp reassured me that those things are normal and have been showing up ever since 1945, ever since the United States bombed Japan. It took me a while, but I eventually accepted those things were harmless and just started letting them go. They would always stare at me reproachfully as I undid my traps and then slowly crawl out of the trap and back into the snow. I have a little more time before my break, so I'll type out one more weird occurrence I had while in the Arctic. There's an urban legend at my camp about a guy who wanders the Arctic plains wearing a suit and nothing else. We call him the businessman. It's said that if you came across him while on a night hunt, he will try to strike a deal with you. It's best to agree to strike a deal, but you can negotiate all you want. Just make sure you say yes to that deal. I luckily never had to encounter the businessman, but a few of my buddies over the years swore up and down they had. Between you and me, sometime in my seventh or eighth year, I was laying out traps and scoping the landscape late one night. I was laying on the top of a snow dune and peering out at one of my traps with a pair of binoculars. My focus trailed to the mountain range in the distance, and walking oh so far away, probably around five or six miles across the snowy plains, was a singular man's silhouette, his pantsuit ripping around his legs ferociously in the wind. Needless to say, I am not one for messing around and I got the hell out of there. Also, I had just bagged some really nice fox fur earlier on this particular venture, and I didn't feel like trading it for whatever nonsense the businessman had for me. I spent the best years of my life fur trapping in the Arctic. They were also the scariest years of my life, too. When I was in college, a couple of us got really deep into urban exploration. I was studying photography, and any excuse to grab crazy pictures was welcome. Thankfully, Detroit offered all kinds of opportunities. My friend Jamie said her boyfriend had been in and around some places over in Brush Park, and maybe we should check it out. I'm all for an adventure, but there are some neighborhoods famous for being dangerous, and Brush Park is pretty much top of the list. I wanted to take some pictures, not get held up. Regardless, when Jamie's boyfriend showed me some of the pictures on his cell phone, I was ready to take the risk. Even with the low resolution, there was clearly lots of amazing stuff to capture. To give you an idea, Brush Park covers around 20 blocks and has streets lined with these big, rambling old German-style houses. Gables, archways, pillars, the works. Picture all that side by side with construction projects and the juxtaposition is wild. We target a couple of blocks right over by where they tore down the Douglas projects as a key place to try and get into some houses. Any urban explorer will tell you that nighttime is when you're less likely to get rounded up. But the photographer in me knows that late afternoon into evening is best for the light. We compromised and headed over right around dusk on a Saturday. We parked at the end of the block and started walking, looking for an ideal fit. I loved places that were pretty ruined, but were still navigable. I wasn't looking to fall through any floorboards or anything. This one house seemed perfect. It was huge. 
The roof over the porch was sagging and some of the windows had been broken out. I snapped some pictures from the outside and we went around back to find an inconspicuous place to climb in. The doors were still bolted, but a window into the kitchen looked like a good option. As soon as I hoisted up to the sill, something seemed off. There was that cool, mildewy, dusty funk that hangs in ruined houses, but just a hint of something else. I got in, and Tom and Jamie followed. Jamie immediately got creeped out and said she wanted to go. Part of me felt the same way, but this place was amazing. The door out of the kitchen opened onto a hallway that made my stomach all squirmy. Evidently, Tom didn't feel any of it because he went right past me and started barging around like an idiot. There was a door in the wall by the staircase that stuck when he tried the knob. That would have been enough for me, but he got all heroic about it and yanked the door open. It sounds crazy, but I'm not kidding when I say that when he did, it sounded like the house exhaled through the door. He got all excited and broke out his flashlight. I came up over his shoulder to look, and it was the door to the basement. The stairs looked sturdy enough, but it was seven kinds of dark down there. My stomach was going crazy telling me to get out, but Tom just smiled and went tromping ahead. Jamie stayed in the kitchen, but I sucked it up and followed into the basement. It was creepy as hell and completely amazing. I must have snapped a thousand pictures before I made it ten feet. The place was packed with all kinds of junk. My instinct was always to find the tightest crevices, so I shoved my way toward the far end where the trash seemed to be the thickest. My hands were clammy and my heart felt like it was in my throat, but I couldn't figure out why. Just before I reached the far corner, something shifted and held my breath. It was so dark, and I lifted my camera to see if the viewfinder could help me see. That little yellow box that frames faces was bobbing around in the middle of the screen, which was super weird because there was nobody there. Then two pinpoints of light flicked on. I forget whether or not I made a sound, but Tom got all tense and asked what was up. Before I could say anything, a whole mass of junk crashed to the side, and this thing crawled out on all fours. It was pale to the point of being gray and moved in kind of a slither. The back legs had those backward joints like a dog, but the front had long, dirty fingers. Its head kept twisting back and forth, tipping up like it was smelling me. I pointed my camera and clicked the shutter, and a flash lit the whole area up. The thing hunched back startled and let out this horrible hissing moan sound. I screamed and it lunged at me. Trying to get out of the way, I stumbled back and bumped into Tom dropping my camera. I could hear Jamie screaming, what's wrong from up in the kitchen, and knew we had to get out of there. The thing lunged again, and I panicked and ran. We both bolted up the stairs and backed down into the kitchen. I don't know if the thing was behind us or not, but I just kept saying, we have to go, we have to go, over and over again. We scrambled back out the window and ran for the car as fast as we could. I'm not sure exactly what it was we saw back there, but it definitely wasn't human. I lost... A long time ago, my grandfather grew up in a rural section of the Appalachian Mountains. He loved it there. He said there was peace in those mountains that he never found anywhere else. The air was clean and crisp, and the woods were incredibly quiet, which I guess some people don't like. I was used to it, though, since it was all I'd ever known. But he told me that he had an encounter with some of his hunting buddies one year that changed his feelings about this place forever. This was during hunting season. His uncle had come up from Florida to go white-tailed deer hunting with some family and friends. He had come up a little before the season started, so he, his dad, older brother, and a couple of friends could go over all their gear and get ready for the hunt. He had a dog that was part Alaskan Husky and part German Shepherd. He said how he would go hiking pretty often, and his dog Max would always go with him. He was a good-sized dog, given the two breeds he was mixed from. He didn't scare easily and was really protective. The day before the hunting season was starting, we were out on one of our usual hikes. They would go up the hill behind my his parents' house to an old coal mining road. There were a couple cold water springs near the road and some deep forest. Usually when he got within a hundred feet or so of the springs, Max would run ahead to get a drink and cool off. Well, he took off, and because of the trees and brush, he couldn't see him. 
but he knew where he would be. He stopped and took a drink from his canteen. As soon as he started moving again, he heard Max running back down the hill. I guess he figured he was coming back to check on him, but he was running full force with a panicked look on his face. I'd never seen that look before. He turned around to look up the hill and he bared his teeth. Then he started growling, very low and very frightening. He was standing stock still, just facing up the hill. Grandpa called his name and he gave a big yelp and took off running full force down the hill again. He thought that was odd, but he kept heading up. Max would just go on home if that's what he wanted to do. He said, I was hoping to see what might have spooked him. There wasn't much wildlife to be feared at the time. Usually just squirrels, chipmunks, deer, possums and such. The scariest thing might be a bobcat or a bear, but I'd never seen one the whole time I'd lived there. I reached the top of the hill without seeing anything scary. I was leaving when I spotted these antlers through the trees. There was a lot of rustling noise coming from that spot, which was a little weird because in my experience, deer are usually so quite... I couldn't imagine Max getting spooked by a deer. He'd been around plenty of them. Anyway, I hoped it was a good sign of whitetail in the area for the start of hunting the next day. I turned to head down and suddenly I was hit with this absolutely putrid smell of rotten flesh. Like if you forgot some meat in your fridge for months and then opened it up. So Grandpa said he headed out of there and got home and found Max in the yard waiting for me. He seemed really restless pacing around. I couldn't figure him out. He told his uncle and everyone that I'd spotted a deer. They were excited to get going in the morning. They got up at the first light and headed out. We were real pros when it came to deer hunting. His father had found a spot he liked and had set up the blind the week before. He said, we got to the blind which was set up near a stand of oaks in sight of the stream. I had binoculars with me so I could do some bird watching while we were sitting there. Waiting on deer can get incredibly boring. You have to be so quiet. We'd probably been there a couple hours when we started hearing this high-pitched sound that sounded like a wounded animal or something. We didn't see anything. It could have been anything. But the next thing that happened was we were hit with the terrible smell of rotting meat. My God, I can't describe it. It smelled like death. My uncle gasped and pointed toward the creek. He had his hand over his nose trying to cover up the smell. We looked and saw this horrible apparition rise up out of the creek, and it was standing there maybe yards away. It was something tall and skeletal. The head looked like a deer skull with antlers and yellow eyes glowing out of the sockets. I swear it was seven feet tall and it seemed like it had tattered flesh just hanging off its body. It walked on two legs, and they looked like the legs of a deer. It seemed like something you would dig out of a grave. But it was moving and scanning the forest. We all just crouched there, peering out of the blind. It didn't seem to have seen us. We were petrified, and just stayed quiet and didn't move a muscle. Then it lifted its head and stared into the distance like it had spotted something. And then it just flashed away at superhuman speed. I can't even describe how it moved. It was just gone. He told me that they went down to the stream where the creature was, and saw, and not far off in the brush surrounded by propped up rocks and vegetation, was what they believed to be a deer carcass. However, upon further investigation, it was definitely not a white-tailed deer. It was way too large, and the antlers were huge. He said that he believed it was the carcass of one of these woods creatures they all saw earlier. The next day, they brought a camera with them and took a picture holding the remains of this carcass. He said, This was the only proof that we had found something in those woods that was not a known species of animal. We started to hear those high-pitched sounds again, and laid the skeleton down and we ran out of there so fast, we couldn't even speak. We all sped down the mountain like our lives depended on it. To this day, he said that they still don't know what they saw or even how to explain it without sounding crazy. He never saw the carcass or creature again, and seemed a bit sad that he didn't feel comfortable in those woods anymore. I've heard other stories that are similar, but never from any of my family members. I feel like that was a really close call for him. A pipe burst in my bathroom, so I had no choice but to find somewhere to stay while they brought in professionals to fix it. 
I had moved in only four months before this, so I was annoyed, as you can imagine. I live in a big-time college football town, so to make matters worse, all the hotel rooms were taken for a big game on Saturday. After frantic phone calls, I found a small place renting one last room. It wasn't close to town, and I couldn't even find a website for it. But it was my only choice, and I needed some place to stay. When I arrived, I thought maybe it was a joke. The place looked like a house so run down it could have been out of business. I parked my car on a gravelly slope and walked into the little door marked Office. A small woman gave me my key and led me deeper into the house. In the back corner she opened a door and flipped a light switch. A naked bulb flashed to life in the center of the ceiling. Suddenly something screamed a blood-curdling sound from outside. I almost jumped. The small woman seemed totally unperplexed, like she'd heard it a million times. She left me alone in the room. I wasn't feeling the vibe at all. I threw my luggage down on the bed and walked back to my car. This place might be okay for a night, but no way was I staying here for more than that. If I had to drive a town over or even 100 miles to find a place to stay, I'd do it. I jumped in my car and heard another loud screaming noise. It sounded like it was coming from everywhere all at once. The woman watched me from the dingy window of the small office. I backed out and started driving down the road. I was driving slowly because the road was bumpy and full of large rocks and potholes. As I was dodging a big jagged hole in the road I saw something from the corner of my eye. I couldn't really make out what it was but it seemed big, like an animal maybe. I slowed the car like an idiot not paying attention. I looked out the window to see if I could get a better look at whatever it was out there in the trees. I saw nothing but then I felt a big jolt. My right front tire had rolled into the hole when I was busy looking out the window, probably at nothing. The car wouldn't move. My tire spun and kicked up gravel and dirt. If anything, pressing on the accelerator only made it worse and dug the tire deeper into the ground. I climbed out and looked at the mess I'd made. My car wasn't going anywhere without some help. I cursed at my luck and my own stupidity. I was tired and getting scared. Something in the trees moved around making scuttling sounds, scraping noises. Tree branches cracked and sputtered. I looked all around trying to see what was there but completely afraid of what I might see. Still there was nothing. I heard the screaming again but now more guttural. Was it closer? I wasn't sure. The sound felt like it was coming from the trees themselves. I pulled out my phone. No reception. Of course. What the heck was I doing out here? I felt so dumb, and now afraid on top of that. I looked back toward the house where I was staying. It wasn't far, but neither was it close. Maybe the length of a football field away from where I stood. I started walking back the way I'd come when I heard another guttural cry, and this time I saw a tree move and a branch break off and fly off to the right. I panicked and hurried back to my car to find something, anything I might use to defend myself. The only thing I had was the ice scraper. I held it in front of me with both hands like a sword, like a silly sword. But I was scared and my fear was only growing. I walked back toward the house as quickly as I could. Something was in the trees and it was moving at the same pace as me, crunching leaves under whatever its feet were. I stopped again and looked all around. I thought I could make out a particularly dark spot in the shade in the trees. I froze and watched that spot. I started walking very slowly again and didn't dare move my eyes from the spot in those trees. Suddenly the screen door on the house creaked open and banged shut with a clutter. The shadow in those trees moved. I swear. I was so scared I couldn't stop shaking and I dropped the ice scraper. I wished more than anything I had someone with me. I couldn't bend down to grab the ice scraper. My legs wouldn't bend. I started running for the house. I was afraid it was the wrong way to go, but going the other way was even scarier. I needed to be inside. I made it to the door and pulled it open. I came inside breathing hard, gasping to catch my breath. The old woman was sitting at the table playing solitary. She looked unfazed. Something scraped the wall directly outside the small window in the kitchen, beside the woman. I heard another scream, this time it was definitely close. 
Was it an animal or human? I couldn't tell and that made it even worse. I closed the door in my room and locked it. I sat on the bed and listened for that awful scream. I didn't hear it again and I didn't sleep either. I thought I heard doors in the house open and close through the night. I sat on the bed all night until the sun came up. I think it was Wednesday and the weather had been bad for a couple weeks. Windy and rainy, making me stuck inside most of the time. I was sitting on the couch trying to read a book. My brother and a couple friends were playing video games and making loud, stupid jokes. I got up, threw my book down, and walked to the kitchen. I opened the cupboard for a snack. The cereal box was empty, and we were out of Pop-Tarts. I felt cheated, which feels silly looking back. I decided to get in better mood and go get cereal. I could take a bike ride through the woods over to the store. A win-win all around. I opened the garage door and was blasted by the cold air. Fall where I'm from sucks and winter is worse. The wind was ripping and I could see my breath. I knew my hands would hurt when I got home and my face was going to be frozen. I fastened my helmet and zipped my jacket. I turned my bike off the road and onto the path through the woods. Runners and jogger sand people walking their dogs were always using the path. The woods are pretty, I guess. To me, they were just trees. But the path was smooth, and it was easy to ride my bike on it. I rode along the path for a bit, just trying to relax and listen to the wind without getting blown over into the dirt. It started raining a little, and the leaves were stirred up from the wind. They made the trail harder to see, and the leaves were wet and slick. I slowed down to ride over a shiny pile of leaves. Suddenly I smelled something awful, like a fart. My tires almost slip on the slimy leaves. I stopped my bike and sniffed the air. It was awful. I pedaled faster and got away from that area of the woods. The smell wasn't as bad after a minute or so. When I left the woods, I went to the store and bought a box of cereal. I threw it in my backpack and got on my bike. I thought about going around the woods taking the long way through the neighborhood. I didn't want to run into any more of that terrible smell, but going around would take a lot longer and it was getting colder every second that passed. My hands already hurt and were turning pink. I pedaled toward the entrance to the path. The smell hit me at once. It was like the entire woods was one big hard-boiled egg. I tried holding my breath and riding my bike faster, but that was dumb. I gasped for air and was hit with the smell again, stronger now. I felt like I might throw up. The only way to get away from the smell was through the woods. One way to go. Forward. I felt scared for the first time, being in the woods alone. The wind was picking up and it pushed that gross smell into my face and up my noise. The smell was so strong now it was burning my eyes. I could feel terrace coming up from the smell and the bitter cold. I rounded a bend on the path and my bike slid out from under me. I didn't go down hard because I wasn't riding too fast. But I rolled and my bike slid and sailed off the path into wet leaves and under a soggy bush. As I sat up, I saw something. I thought it was a huge bat. But that made no sense. I rubbed my eyes. When I looked back it was a little to the right and now it looked like an emaciated horse. The thing, that's the word that came to me. Its eyes looked like yellow egg yolks, and it stuck its tongue out. It was long, too long. I felt a chill run up my spine. The thing stood up taller. It kept going. It must have ten feet tall. I could see ribs through a long black torso. The legs were bowed out like a wonky goat. The smell was so strong now, it was all I could think about. That and whatever the hell was standing there in the woods only twenty feet from me. The thing in front of me lifted its arms and spread these long, disgusting wings. It looked like something out of a kid's nightmare. My nightmare. The wings were scaled like a dragon or the toes of a frog. Those eyes stared into mine and the smell got even worse. I swear the eyes on that thing turned from yellow to red and they shrunk down to hot red beads in the long, freakish face. I couldn't move, but I had to. I couldn't sit there and wait for whatever it was to come toward me. I crawled toward my bike under the bushes. I kept one eye on that beast. 
The giant head slowly turned and was following me with that goblin-like stare. And then a miracle happened. Maybe. I don't know. It seemed like a miracle at the time. Three joggers came down the path toward me. They stopped a little ahead of me and asked if I was okay. Some kid crawling on top of wet leaves on a path. I looked to the joggers to see where the thing had been standing. It was gone. The smell was still strong, but it was going away. Following the thing I'd seen, the joggers could smell it too. I pulled my bike out from under the bush and pedaled past the joggers as fast I could. I've never told anyone what I saw out there. But when someone asks me to ride my bike through the woods, I say I'd rather go around. The East Coast wasn't the easiest place to be when you were on your own at 18. I don't mean that it was hard or particularly unforgiving. It was just expensive. Everywhere is expensive now, though. At least I guess that means everyone will be able to relate to the setting I'm about to describe. I was 18, working as many hours as I could each week and living out of a single bedroom that I was renting in a rough neighborhood. There were four rooms in the single-story building, if you included the living room, and each room was rented by a different person. I had the room in the back. I had to walk through two other living areas just to reach my door. Once inside, the room wasn't impressive either. I had enough space for a twin-sized mattress and a dresser. The area between the dresser and the mattress was just big enough to stand in, unless you needed to open the drawers. To the left of that dresser, back toward the door, there was also a window. I couldn't afford curtains. The old blinds that hung there did their best to block out the light. Unfortunately for me, there was light in that window 24-7. The house I was living in used to sit next to a bank. The bank building had been demolished, but the parking lot was still in place. The lights still lit up in that lot each night right at sundown, and they shined on through the morning. It often cast my room in an uncomfortable electric glow. Those nights I was tired enough to sleep through anything. One night I woke suddenly with my eyes fixated on the window. I didn't have to blink any weariness away from my vision. I wasn't confused or disoriented. I was immediately alert. My eyes knew exactly where to look the moment that they opened. There was a dark silhouette framed against my window. They weren't outside. They weren't in the parking lot. They were on my side of the blinds. The light coming in from behind them made their features hard to make out. I stood anyway. I thought what I was facing was a thief who had slipped in from the outside. When I leaped to my feet, occupying the little space between the intruder and myself, I realized how wrong I was. I wasn't struggling to make out their features because of the light. They had no features at all. Their body was a smooth black void, darker than the further corners of my room. Looking at them felt empty. It felt like they were hollow, sucking out the light like a black hole. My body went cold. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe to scream. The shape looked familiar. It was sort of like a man. Legs, torso, arms, and shoulders. But it felt sinister. I knew all at once that it was there to hurt me. It would kill me if I let it. But there was no fighting this thing. Even if I could move, what would I do? I never got to answer that question because it moved first. It reached out with one arm and sunk its hand into my chest. It didn't cut me. It passed into me like my skin and bones weren't even there. I felt each digit of its cold hand wrap one at a time around my heart. I've never been so physically aware of where each organ sits in my body. The cold chill of the apparition's touch may as well have been shining a light on my insides. I was confident the end was coming. I felt myself tremble. I felt tears stream down my face. I started praying in my mind, frantically begging God to spare my life. In my inner monologue, I was rambling about everything I had left to do. I'd do so many good things, I promised. I had never prayed before. I didn't know I believed in a higher power until that moment. I prayed hard and fast and felt my heartbeat slow. I felt the thing in my window get angry. All of a sudden, it released its grip. The apparition shoved me backward. I landed on my bed and crawled hurriedly into the corner. 
I brought my knees to my chest and stared, eyes glued to the window. There was no shape there anymore. No silhouette stood in the dark, pretending to be a man. But the tears were still on my face. My heart was racing, but I could still feel the places where the thing had coiled its fingers. I sat there all night, wide awake and waiting. When the sun rose, I left that room and called my best friend. He was nice enough to pretend to believe me. He couldn't offer me any advice or tell me what it was, not that I expected him to. Still, the lack of answers kept me asking. I looked around online. I had a few people message me anonymously with their own theories. I've heard everything from demons to aliens at this point. I don't know what to believe. Did praying really help? Does that tell me it was divine? I stopped talking about the encounter for years. All it did anymore was hike my anxiety and earn me a few quizzical stares. I kept reminding myself that it could have been a dream. There's a chance, right? There's a chance that it didn't push me back onto the bed. Maybe I was just waking up for real that time. It's been more than 12 years now. I haven't seen the silhouette again, but now I have a child of my own. My child might be staring at their own window one day, seeing what I saw. I need to know now. I need to know so that if it does come back, I'm not helpless like I was before. What was that thing shaped like a man? Let me start off by saying this. I am no conspiracy theorist. I am not someone who just sits around on Facebook all day trying to catch up on whatever crazy things that some crazy people are pushing through their keyboards. I see myself as somewhat of a nomad or whatever. I've lived out of my van once for a while. Me and my van, see, we've been through a lot together. Traveling the country, avoiding rent, general van life perks. One of the things that is not a perk of living in your van, though, is parking out in creepy places without necessarily knowing how safe it's going to be. At this time, coming up on a year ago now, I was doing somewhat of a tour through the northwestern part of the country. I wanted to see some of the natural sights, tourism stuff, the works. I ended up staying near one of these really gorgeous parks in Washington State. It was secluded, had a lot of cool plants around, and most importantly, it was legal for me to park there, so I decided on that spot to park the van while I stayed there. A little spoiler alert, I did not pick an ideal spot. The area itself wasn't that creepy, just kind of in the middle of nowhere. You could tell that not a lot of people came around there often. So the first night I'm staying there, I go and take a little hike around the park's trails. It isn't even too late when I left, around 6 p.m., so I figured there was no big deal in exploring a little. I end up taking my time out there, and when I got back, it was already dark out. I'd say, I don't know, around 9 p.m., and when I got to my van, let me tell you, I have never been more furious in my life. All around my van scattered are my few precious belongings. My bedspread, all my clothes, books, everything. Just torn up dirty or otherwise thrown on the ground. The worst of it all, my doors, halfway torn off the hinges. Obviously, I assumed it was some kind of animal, but the thing was, I can't think of one damn animal strong enough to pull the doors of a van off of their hinges. So once I'm done cursing and being pissed off, I start to get kind of scared. You see, I noticed that even though my stuff was scattered around, nothing was actually missing. Except my mini-fridge. And no, I don't mean the stuff inside my mini-fridge, but the actual physical appliance. It was nuts. Whatever creature was in my van took my mini-fridge and booked it. Needless to say, I was kind of freaked out. I started to clean up my stuff while picking everything up. Almost every single item had the most terrible stench on them. This was some next-level gross. First off, they smelled like urine. Straight nasty urine smell, and definitely not something with a healthy diet. It was foul. The second thing, maybe even stronger than the urine smell, was the fact that everything reeked of wet dog. Dirty wet dog, worse than any dog I've ever smelled, but still definitely the same scent. I figured that it would be best if I just packed my stuff up and left to go somewhere else. I have a bit of money saved up due to my budgeted lifestyle, but something told me that I should wait a while to try and see what the heck did this to my van. So I decided I'd spend the night, just the night, and leave the next day. 
I'm lucky I escaped with my life, I think. Once it got dark, it of course began to rain. A lighter storm for sure, but annoying as heck with the no doors thing. I had a little pair of binoculars in my hiking backpack, so I stationed myself to look out the window of the driver's seat just in case I had to book it. For a while it was a whole lot of nothing, just me kind of half asleep to the rain sounds looking out of the window. But that's when I saw it. At first, swear to God I thought it was just a really tall guy, just standing there out in the storm. So stupidly, I called out to him. It. That made it notice me, turn in my direction, and it was then when I realized that not only was this monster not a person, but it was sitting down. It stood up to almost ten feet, I swear to you. It has these little beady eyes that you could tell just saw straight through you. A weird ass, almost cone-shaped head, covered top to bottom in fur. This sounds crazy, but I feel like it could have been a Sasquatch. The thing was built like a professional weightlifter, too. Massive biceps that probably explained how torn up my van was. Me and this giant. We locked eyes for a while, and then it started coming closer. I freaked the out. What else could someone possibly do in a situation like this? Stay calm? I turned on the van, but it was stalling, and this felt like I was in my very own horror movie. It wasn't running at me so much as cautiously crawling, but I wasn't going to risk anything. I wanted out of there. Then, almost like fate, there was this giant lightning crack nearby. It wasn't in sight, but you could hear it loud as hell. This definitely scared me, but the creature, it ran for the hills. It definitely didn't like loud noises. I tried a few more times, then my van started. I lived to tell the tale too, but nobody thinks I'm being serious. They think it was a coyote pack or a crazy fox or something. So I figured if anyone believed me, it would be you. When I got out of high school, I enrolled in college thinking it would just be a continuation of what I was used to. But during my first semester, I realized I couldn't handle it. I don't know if I just couldn't handle the new freedom or what. I didn't have my parents breathing down my neck and I just would never get my assignments done. Then I started getting into other bad things and that didn't help. I was living in Alaska and I decided I needed a total change of scenery. I just kind of looked at a map and picked out Arizona as probably the complete opposite environment from what I was used to. I moved down there and looked for a job. After going through a few dead-end things like fast food worker and amusement park attendant, I decided to apprentice under a plumber. Sometimes the work was disgusting, but it paid well. I hadn't had any money my whole life. After I got better at it, I would do side work on my own as long as it was within my skill level. One day my boss said he was sending me out to this job that was about 100 miles away from Phoenix where I was living. I was kind of surprised because most of the jobs were local and I could always call on my boss if I needed him. But I went down there to test myself out. It was this old run-down cabin that some lady had just bought. It had old lead pipes that needed replacing. And she wanted me to make sure all the drains were working and stuff. It sounded like something I could handle. I stopped by where she was staying and she gave me the keys. By that time it was evening, but I decided to go ahead and head over and work through the night. I got there around 8 p.m. and set up my generator and floodlights on the exterior and got to work running some pipe for a hose spigot. I was alone and wearing my headphones listening to some music. After prepping the outside of the cabin, I went to my truck to get some pipe. When I turned around, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. The area outside of the floodlights range was pitch black. I took my headphones off to look and listen, but I couldn't see or hear anything. I shrugged it off, thinking my mind was just playing tricks on me. After a few minutes, I put my headphones back on and got back to work. I was busy screwing some pipe brackets to the wall. Then during a song transition, I heard something strange. I could swear I heard this clicking, hissing sound. I shot upright and placed my back against the wall. I still couldn't see what was making the noise, and I couldn't even really tell where it was coming from. There are snakes in the area, so I was pretty terrified. But I was pretty sure that snakes aren't nocturnal. But we didn't have snakes in Alaska, so I wasn't totally sure. I stood there really still, 
and after about 30 seconds it stopped. I got back to work without my headphones on and then I heard the sound again. I hated not knowing what it was. I kind of shimmied along the wall until I got to a tree growing in the yard. I climbed up it so I would have some kind of vantage point. I didn't know if snakes climbed trees. I was really ignorant on the whole subject of snakes. I got myself situated on a branch and swung my head light around the yard. There was a low fence around the lady's yard, maybe four feet high. On the other side, there were all kinds of things growing, like cactus and yuccas and shrubs. It was really thick over there, so anything could have been hiding there. Then I saw movement, and I was horrified to see these two glowing yellow eyes looking at me. Something looked like it was crouched down right on the other side of the fence. My heart was already pounding, but then the freaking thing stood up. It looked taller than me, and I'm six feet tall. It had black claws that were gripping the fence. They were huge. I could even see its sharp teeth. It looked like some kind of giant lizard. But it stood on two legs, so it almost seemed like it could be partly human. I don't know why I say that, but it gave me a feeling of some kind of humanoid. It had an evil presence. I was pretty sure it could get to me in the tree. My truck was parked in the yard about 30 feet away from me. My keys were in it. I decided to take a chance. I jumped down from the branch and ran. About halfway there, the hissing started again. I sprinted the other 15 or so feet and slammed the door and laid on my horn trying to scare whatever it was off. I looked over and couldn't tell at all if it was still there. I moved my truck to face the spot and turned on my headlights. It wasn't there anymore, but I had no idea which direction it had gone. There was no way I wanted to leave my tools there, so I pretty much just sat in my truck until morning. The next day I collected all my stuff and got the hell out of there. I tried to explain to my boss why I had to abandon the job. He wasn't happy with me at all, but he didn't fire me. He decided to give me another chance since I'd been doing good work up until that point. But holy crap, I've never been so scared in my life. I've always been sensitive to things that others can't see or hear. My mom used to think I was just making up stories to scare my siblings, but I wasn't. Growing up, we all had chores. We were a big family. I was the oldest of six kids. It was just normal to have chores, and being cranky about doing them was pretty typical too. This particular night though, nothing was typical. I was washing dishes, minding my own business. Everyone else was in bed, which was pretty normal. I wasn't able to do my chores until after the kids went to sleep because so much of my time was spent helping with them. I kept hearing heavy footsteps behind me, which I tried to ignore. I knew that it wasn't anything that I could control, so I ignored them. Even though I had a pit in my stomach, I just kept working. I was so used to the strange and unexplainable happening that I refused to let it phase me anymore. I had told my mom about the weirdness several times before, but she just blew me off. She would tell me I had a vivid imagination. But that night, things changed. The footsteps had started to get heavier. Whatever was making them was angry, but I still refused to turn around. Soon the footsteps were right behind me, and I was struggling to ignore them. I knew they were there. I knew it was angry. It didn't like being ignored. I continued to focus on the last few dishes I had. I was close to being done and able to head to bed myself. As I rinsed the last pan, all of the cabinet doors flew open. I gasped and jumped, spinning around and searching the room for anything that could have caused it. Of course, there was nothing there, except my mom in her doorway, glaring at me. I quickly explained that it was not me and closed the cabinets, apologizing for the noise. She sighed and sat down in the recliner. Apparently, she was going to watch me finish my chores because of the noise. I had just started wiping down the countertops when the footsteps started again, racing back and forth behind me, getting louder with each pass. I looked over at my mom, who looked incredibly confused. She whispered, what on? But before she could finish her thought, every cabinet door flew open and every drawer slammed open. I yelped and jumped away from the sink, shaking as I tried to calm down. I had dealt with the footsteps for months, 
but this was the first time it had ever gotten physical with anything substantial, and I didn't know what to expect. Even though I was scared, I closed all of the cabinets and the drawers, hoping that this was the last of the activity for the night. But as soon as I stepped back to the sink to rinse the rag in my hand, the drawers flew open and dumped all over the floor. This time I screamed. The knife drawer was closest to the sink and narrowly missed my bare feet. My mom jumped up and ran into the kitchen. She was obviously shaken. We didn't speak as we started to put the kitchen back together. I don't think there were words for what we were feeling. I knew that she hadn't believed me, but how could she deny what she witnessed with her own eyes? As we finished putting the last of the silverware back in the drawer and the drawer back in its track, I asked, do you believe me now? She just nodded and wiped her hands on her pants. I let her know I would finish up and she could go on to bed. No need for us to both be terrified. No sooner did my mom shut her bedroom door and the footsteps started again. But this time I spun around and asked, What do you want? Why are you messing with me? Of course, I didn't expect a response. It just made me feel better to say it out loud. What I didn't count on was seeing a figure standing there. He was about six foot tall, had on an old, old business suit, like the ones you see in the old westerns and a top hat. He was there, but he wasn't, if that makes sense. I could see him, but I could also see the table through him. He only looked at me a moment before he started pacing again. I couldn't move. I just watched him as he paced back and forth. I wasn't sure what to do, but I didn't want to draw any more attention to myself. It was only a few minutes before he just disappeared. One second he was there and the next he was gone. That was the only time I ever saw the man, but I heard his footsteps every night until we moved. At some point they became just a normal part of my night. I never ignored him again though. When I would hear him start pacing I would always say hello. I knew that he could mess with physical objects, but he never did again. I'm not sure if that is because I acknowledged him or if he just didn't find the answer he thought he would by scaring me. I still can't believe what I saw all these years later. And sometimes I still wonder if I dreamed it up. I hope that if you read this, someone can relate and will let me know that they believe me. Because even though my mom helped me, she never once talked to me about it. So I have been left knowing this happened, but not knowing how much of my memory is exaggerated. I know it sounds crazy. I really do, but I needed someone else to hear my story and possibly understand. I had nothing against squirrels until they started coming in my house. They've always been annoying, but we pretty much let each other be. I live a bit south of Trenton in New Jersey, near Mount Holly. I assume squirrels are a problem everywhere. I don't know though, because I've always lived in this area and I haven't done much traveling. I started noticing how many squirrels were in my backyard last Halloween. I'd gotten some pumpkins that were going to be jack-o'-lanterns. I'd put them outside until I was ready to carve them. Right away, they started getting chewed up and were ruined. Before long, the squirrels had whittled them down to nothing. I was outside looking around and saw that the big tree from the neighbor's house was growing right toward my roof. That made it really easy for squirrels to scamper around on top of my house. I didn't think much of it though, and I figured it was a lesson learned to not leave your pumpkins outside. Anyway, about a week after Halloween, I was chilling in my house one night and heard this horrible screeching sound outside. I looked out my back window, but I couldn't see anything. My back porch light is broken. It's not just the light bulb, it's something electrical, so I didn't know how to fix it. The noise was so loud and creepy. I was really starting to wonder why I was attracting all this wildlife. I couldn't imagine what could make that screeching sound. I put it out of my mind and went to bed. But the next morning when I woke up, I was hearing some really odd thumping noises. I thought it was my neighbor working outside. But then I heard a crash outside my bedroom door. I rushed out and saw one of my wooden carvings laying on the floor. I heard a bunch of shuffling in the bathroom and headed back there, and to my horror, a squirrel was staring back at me. I couldn't figure out what had happened. The only thing I could assume was that it had gotten down the chimney somehow. 
I screamed and it ran away from me and crawled into my undersink bathroom cabinet. I was really freaked out and didn't know what to do. It wouldn't come out for anything. I left the back door open which was really close to the bathroom. I assumed it would just automatically sense the fresh air and run out. But no dice. I played squirrel sounds for it on my phone thinking that would entice it to come out. But nothing worked. Then I ordered a squirrel trap on Amazon to be overnighted to me. I read that squirrels love apples and peanut butter. I crammed the squirrel trap into my tiny bathroom and set it with the food inside. But the bastard managed to get the apple out without springing the trap. Then it went back into the cabinet and just hung out there. It lived in that cabinet for 72 hours before I was finally able to trap it and relocate it. It was traumatizing, but I was glad it was over until three days later when it happened again. I woke up to another one of those jerks in my house. This time I had secured the door of the bathroom, so if it happened again, a squirrel couldn't hide out in there. I managed to get it out the back door. But it was really unprecedented to have such an unlikely thing happen again. I should mention that I'd still been hearing that screeching sound several days in a row. I started wondering if there was a connection. That night I was sitting on my couch minding my own business. I'd been hearing the screeching intermittently. Then I heard this little scurrying sound and I looked toward my kitchen and saw this mouse just running along the baseboards. I've lived in this house for over 10 years without so much as an ant coming in. I felt surrounded and really creeped out. I got back on Amazon and ordered mouse traps. I got my flashlight and opened the back door to see if I could tell where that sound was coming from. Even before I turned on the flashlight, I saw something big crouched on the top of my back fence. The worst part was, it was looking at me. Its eyes were yellow and glowing. We had just come off of Halloween, so the impression I got was something like a goblin. I didn't even want to, but I turned on my flashlight. It was even worse than I expected. It had this elongated, skeletal face like a horse or a dragon. It had scaly skin. As soon as I had turned on the flashlight, it had risen up from its crouched position and I could see that it had wings. It was terrifying to think that it might fly at me. I slammed the door closed and that screeching started up again. I turned off all the lights in the house so it wouldn't be able to see me in there. I've never been so petrified before in my life. I kept trying to watch out my window to see what it would do. The neighbors behind my alley had their lights on, so I could kind of make it out. After about an hour, it turned its back to my house and half jumped and half flew off my fence. I couldn't tell which direction it went. There was certainly nothing I could order on Amazon for that freaking thing. I'm still really scared, and I don't even know what I would say if I tried to report it. I'm starting to think these animals were coming in my house because they were scared of it too. I should have never gone to the woods late at night. I regret what I saw. I can't get anyone else to believe me when I tell this story, so I'm hoping I can reach someone that went through something similar. I live in the infamous town called Salem in Massachusetts. Almost all of us have heard of the Salem Witch Trials. In fact, that's what my town is known for. I wish my story involved witches instead. It would be a lot easier for me and more believable. Anyways, now that you get an idea where I live, let me tell you what happened on the night of July 13th this a few years ago. I decided to go out with a few of my friends and we drank. We were in the middle of the woods just having fun, having a nice bonfire and everything going. I think it was around 1 or 2 in the morning when we all decided we were going to pack up and stumble back home. The ones who were less drunk were buddied up with the really drunk ones to make sure everyone got back home safely. Well. I was one of the people who didn't have as much to drink as the rest, and my house was only a few blocks away from the entrance of the woods we were in. So I was fine walking by myself. As I was following the trail to the entrance of the woods, I saw something staring at me behind a tree. I thought it was one of my buddies that decided it would be funny to prank me, so I played along and pretended to be scared. I thought I heard them say something, but then I looked more closely at them and I realized I did not know who was in front of me. 
The eyes were popping out of their sockets almost, the mouth was curled into a malicious smile, and I could see something popping out of its head. This was not anywhere near Halloween, so I do not know why someone would have any sort of costume on at this time of year. I just stood there and froze. I didn't know what to do. Whoever it was behind the tree started to come out, and before I got a better look, I made a break for it and ran. I don't know where I was running to, but I ended up at the entrance to the woods. I stumbled into a few friends of mine that were also making their way to their houses and helping the wasted ones up to their doors. I didn't want to run into whatever that was in the woods earlier, so I just made my way home and into my bed. When I got in bed, I was thinking if I was just seeing things because I was drunk. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I wasn't even that drunk. Sure, I was lightheaded, but I was still able to talk to my friends, and I was able to walk somewhat without stumbling too much. I was clear-minded. When I went to sleep, though, the weirdest thing happened to me. I dreamt I was still in the woods in front of the thing I saw earlier. But this time I wasn't able to move. It slowly stepped out from behind the tree and walked towards me. It didn't talk, but I thought I could hear it say something in my head. I just heard the word suffer over and over again. It was in a deeper voice, but yet it felt like it was screaming at me. I felt like my head was going to explode with how the thing talked. It looked human except for whatever it was on top of its head. I woke up after it was face to face with me, and it opened its mouth. That morning I started texting my buddies who were probably experiencing hangovers if any of them saw me in the woods and decided to play a prank on me. The really drunk ones didn't remember, but their walking buddy had both of them accounted for. No one else knew what I was talking about. I asked my parents if they could have any idea what was going on, and they chalked it up to me being drunk and not to worry so much about it. That was three months ago. I still see the person or thing or whatever it is in my dreams. I dreamt I woke up before with it in my bedroom doorway and it started hissing at me while smiling. I started having strange marks on my arms and my body about two months ago. I don't own any animals, mind you, and I stopped drinking since. No one believes me, not even my family. They think I am self-inflicting these wounds on me, and when I tell them I'm not, they just don't believe me. No matter what I tell anyone, they just think that I am drunk when I text or call them and that I am just trying to scare them. I keep having these dreams or whatever it is, and then I wake up with a cut or even a bruise on some part of my body. Wherever the thing marked me, I woke up with it. It's to the point where I have been threatened to be institutionalized if I don't knock it off with self-harming or my crazy stories. I never had a history of any mental illnesses or self-harm in the past, but no one believes me. What do you think it is? Am I going insane, or was I not supposed to run into whatever it was in the woods? I'm afraid to close my eyes at this point, and I just need someone to believe me. Someone to save me from whatever is going on. My grandfather had something really strange happen to him when he was seven years old. He was playing in the backyard and was suddenly overwhelmed by the smell of rotting garbage or something decomposing. He decided to investigate and started poking around at the edge of the woods that bordered the yard. Grandpa moved branches and foliage with a long stick, but he didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Both of his parents had told him many times not to go into the woods alone. But the smell got stronger and curiosity pushed him into the trees. He stepped carefully, sure that he was close to a dead raccoon or possum and not wanting to step on it. Grandpa kept going and in just a few minutes came to a small clearing that he did not recognize. The smell of rotten garbage was so thick that he was nearly choking, but that wasn't the weirdest part. Directly in the middle of the clearing was something that definitely did not belong. When he told me the story, he described it as a silver Rubik's cube and it was four or five stories high. The outside was covered in what Grandpa's seven-year-old brain identified as armor of some kind that glowed a bit where the sunlight was hitting it. It was completely smooth, and there was a walkway of some kind leading down to the ground. Standing at the bottom of the walkway were two figures that looked mostly human, except for their weird clothing and elongated heads. It looked like they had been waiting for him. Once they spotted him looking at them, 
they started beckoning at him, waving him closer with hands that only had three long fingers. They were wearing what looked like what my grandfather identified as work clothes, some kind of overall or jumpsuit that looked like they were made out of the same material as rain boots. They were taller than Grandpa, but definitely not giants. Grandpa couldn't help himself. He started walking toward them. He said that it felt like an invisible rope was pulling him closer, step by step. He wasn't afraid at all, just insanely curious about what was inside that shiny cube. By now, he had decided that these figures must be aliens. He'd seen them in his older brother's science fiction magazines, and he knew that they came from the far reaches of the galaxy. But his older brother had told them that the stories were all made up. Grandpa couldn't wait to tell him about this. Before he knew it, he was up the walkway and inside the ship. There was one alien on either side of him, but they weren't touching him. It was bright inside, but he couldn't see any wires or light bulbs. It was like the walls in the long hallway were lit from within. It seemed to stretch out for miles on either side and seemed to be much bigger on the inside than it appeared from the outside. The trio started walking down the hallway. The aliens were chattering away to each other in a series of chirps and clicking sounds, but Grandpa didn't think they were trying to talk to him. He did take a moment to wonder why he wasn't scared. A year earlier, a little boy had disappeared from the small town where my grandfather's family lived, so he'd received many lectures about avoiding strangers and the danger of going off with someone he didn't know. He knew that this wasn't what his parents had in mind during those conversations, but who could have possibly imagined this? Grandpa didn't see any stairs or doors on their long walk. He wanted to see the place where the aliens flew the ship. He also didn't see anything that hinted toward the cause of the rotten smell, so realized it must be coming from the aliens themselves. The taller alien finally stopped in front of a portion of the wall that looked exactly like the rest to my grandfather's eyes. He reached inside of his jumpsuit and pulled out a card, which he waved in front of the wall. It slid open, and that is when Grandpa started to get a bit nervous. It looked like a doctor's office with a table in the middle of the large room. There were some machines clustered around the table, but more alarmingly, there were eight more aliens standing there. They stood in a line, with their hands clasped in front of their bodies. The two accompanying my grandfather each grabbed one of his little arms, but they didn't have to drag him to the table because his feet were still moving under some other power. He walked right to the table and then stepped up on the little stool that seemed to be there for just that purpose. Grandpa sat on the edge of the table, his legs dangling over the side. What was going to happen? Would they hurt him? Would they take him back to their planet? Would he ever see his family again? One of the aliens approached, chirping softly. It slowly reached out a hand and patted my grandfather on the head, and then it pulled a giant pair of scissors out of nowhere. My grandfather finally started yelling, and that was the last thing that he remembered. When he woke up, he was lying in his own backyard, just a few yards from the porch. He could hear my grandmother yelling in the house, saying that it was time for everyone to get up for the day. It was chilly, and his head felt really cold. He ran his hands over his body, but nothing hurt or seemed out of place. Grandpa reached a hand up to his scalp and found that his hair was completely cut away in some places. And that was where the story ended. When I asked him what happened next, he just said, I got in trouble for cutting my own hair. He never told his parents about any of it because he didn't want to get yelled at for going into the woods alone. I don't want to give too many personal details because I'm not sure what I'm allowed to talk about and what will get government suits knocking on my door. The Pentagon released those three UFO tapes in 2020, so none of this should be too controversial for Uncle Sam. What I will say is that I served in the United States Navy from 2015 to 2019. I spent nearly all my time in the Navy on aircraft carriers, the big ships you see in movies that launch jets off their decks. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out Top Gun. I highly recommend it. I wasn't a pilot or anything cool like that, but I had a good time in the Navy. My best memories are from when I was part of 7th Fleet. 
Yokosuka was a fun place to be stationed. At least when the sailors and marines there weren't doing something stupid, it was fun. The command would take away off base privileges if we got too rowdy in town and the local authorities complained. Sometimes the Japanese could be a bit touchy about stuff. I won't mention any specific ships, but we patrolled the Pacific around Japan, China, Indonesia, basically all around Asia and the South Pacific. Things were a little hot back then, still are I hear, because China keeps trying to assert its dominance in the South China Sea. Dumb things, like building bases near major international shipping lanes and then claiming that part of the sea as their territorial waters. Real geopolitical pissing contest stuff. Regardless, we were always on mission. This is around 2017 and 2018, playing chicken with the Chinese Navy, making sure they knew we didn't respect their imaginary boundaries by flying over them. We weren't looking for a fight or anything, but we always prepared like one would break out. It's standard Navy operating procedure. I was an aviation ordinanceman, AO for short, so it was my job to make sure the planes had their weapons serviced and ammo fully stocked for a firefight. The dogs with the biggest teeth fight the least, my chief always said. I was out on the carrier deck one evening loading some ordnance onto a recently returned jet when I heard some chatter on the comms. My headset was a bit crappy so I couldn't get some of it, but I saw a yellow shirt, the guys who waved the jets in, looking up in the sky intently. I asked the yellow shirt what was up, and he said one of our pilots saw something weird in the air. I was a little jumpy when I heard that. We were close to the disputed border and I figured China launched a few planes of their own to test our nerve. I didn't want to be a part of an international incident. The pilot was circling the ship at different altitudes. I could make out over the comms that he was searching for something that dropped off his radar. This went on for a while. Eventually, he was ordered to land and refuel. I didn't know the pilot, but I'd seen him around the chow hall in the gym. He had a pretty heavy deadlift, so I've noticed him before. I went over to his plane and checked on his armaments. I knew they were good because my buddy Ryan worked the day shift and his crew put them on, but I wanted to get close enough to hear what the pilot was saying to the yellow shirt. It's crazy loud on the flight deck, so you have to be right on top of people to hear them. The pilot didn't say much, just that he caught something on his radar that was moving strangely, not like a jet, not even obeying basic physics. That was creepy. Maybe a new kind of Chinese drone. Top Brass must have liked the idea even less than me because we dropped anchor and stayed put for another three days. We had to work port and starboard, meaning half the ship works for 12 hours and the other half works 12, launching and refueling planes on loop while they searched for the strange object. It was miserable. We had just enough time after our shift to shower, eat, and sleep before we had to muster back on the flight deck. The command refused to use the word UFO, but some of the crew was starting to say it couldn't have been a new Chinese drone, and the pilot who saw it was clearly freaked out. I've never been a big believer in UFOs, but on the third night of anchor I saw something that I know human technology cannot do. I was on the flight deck checking the missiles on a jet when an extremely bright bluish light flooded the sky. It wasn't so harsh that we couldn't look at it, but it somehow still illuminated everything perfectly evenly. The strangest thing about it was how the light looked blue, silver, or green depending on what angle you looked at it. The light shot backwards and then up in a zigzag pattern. It didn't accelerate or slow down between maneuvers. It stopped and started like inertia, and air resistance didn't exist. It moved like a giant invisible hand was jerking it around in the sky, like a kid playing with a toy airplane. The light was still for a few minutes, and then slowly circled the carrier deck in a wide arc. It was about a quarter of a mile away, but the light was easy to spot. Our comms gear was going wild. I could hear snippets of voices trying to give us orders, but a metallic humming blocked any coherent messages from getting through. A green shirt finally pieced enough of the message together to know they wanted us to launch every available jet that was currently on the deck. We launched the first plane as fast as we could and watched it take off and bank wide left to approach the humming blue slash silver slash green light. I don't think anyone on the flight deck was breathing as the plane approached. When the jet got within a few hundred yards, the light just dropped out of the sky like it was a puppet whose strings were cut. 
We all ran to the edge of the deck, but there was no splash or sound of impact. The light was just gone. For four more days, we worked continuously to launch and land planes, searching every inch of ocean for a sign of that strange aircraft. I even heard they pulled one of our ballistic submarines from their post to search the seabed. They never touched the submarines for anything. They are our greatest nuclear deterrent. We spent another two days in debriefing rooms where they told everyone on the deck and the control tower who saw the incident to keep our mouths shut. They used legal language, of course, but the message was the same. Not sure if this is still supposed to be hush-hush, what with the release of UFO videos, but I thought it was time I shared my personal experience with them. I live in the heart of Philadelphia, a few blocks north of Center City just before it starts to get too sketchy. It's always busy and always crowded, so I never expected to come across anything like this. It all happened on what was easily the worst day of my life. I was in Fairmount, near where my girlfriend and our son lived with her parents. Both her mom and dad are lawyers that work for a law firm that defends other lawyers, so they live in a real nice townhouse on North Woodstock Street right behind the Eastern State Penitentiary. If you're not a Philly native, you've probably still heard of the old prison. It was once the most expensive prison in the world and held notorious criminals like Al Capone, but is now just a historic landmark most famous for being an elaborate haunted house around Halloween. I didn't live with my girl and son because we couldn't all fit in my tiny apartment and her parents were not a big fan of mine. It sucked, but the schools around her parents' neighborhood were fantastic and I wanted to give my son the best chance. Me and my girl were having a knockdown drag out fight that night and we broke up. I was in a bad place. I stormed out of the house and walked down Fairmount Ave towards the bus stop. A bus finally came rolling down the street, but the LCD display board on the front of the bus was blank. It didn't show any destination. Normally they say off duty if they are not on a route, so I assumed it was just busted. It rumbled to a stop at the bus stop. I walked towards the door, but the unmarked bus started to speed off. I was pissed and chased it down the street. I picked up cans and gravel off the street and threw them at the back of the bus. After about half a block, the bus stopped and the door opened. I was surprised. I didn't expect it to stop after the hissy fit I just threw, and I wasn't sure if I should actually get on. My anger from the fight with Michelle overtook my caution, and I walked onto the bus. I tried to pay, but the driver just smiled and jerked his thumb to the back, indicating for me to take a seat. By all accounts, the bus looked normal, but everything was off. It was all so... indistinct. I still can't picture the face of the driver. I couldn't tell you his hair color or what nationality he was. I sat near the back of the bus. There weren't many people on the bus but everyone I passed looked just as miserable as I did, like this bus was a vehicle for people at their lowest point. I didn't see a single smiling face on the whole bus. We rode for hours, passing indistinct neighborhoods. It all looked familiar, but I couldn't place any local landmarks. It felt like I was touring a movie set built to look like Philadelphia, but wasn't actually the city. I felt an overwhelming sense of lethargy. I wasn't even bothered about where we were going. Occasionally we would stop, and someone would just stand up and get off. The people getting off looked surprised to be leaving. These looked like random spots, but those exiting the bus clearly knew their surroundings. As we drove, I replayed the argument I had with Michelle over and over again in my mind, realizing what I should have said or shouldn't have said. Maybe I had been too harsh and defensive. Maybe I need to be more understanding. We only picked one person up while I was on the bus. It played out very closely to how I got on. The bus stopped and then sped off. Leave the poor soul to chase us down the street. What really struck me though, was how he seemed to be the only one in the crowd to notice us. There were other people at that bus stop, but they didn't seem to notice us rolling in. Hours or days later, I honestly could not tell you I had an epiphany. It was a crystallizing moment of clarity where I knew exactly what I had to do. Just as the thought burst into my mind, the bus stopped. I looked out my window and realized we were back on Fairmount. 
The look of surprise on the other passengers' faces just before they got off the bus suddenly made sense to me. I ran off that bus and knocked on the door to my girlfriend's place. She ripped the door open instantly like she had been standing right at the doorway. I realized she had been... Her clothes were the same as when I left her. The sun was in the same position, and everything looked exactly as it had when I left. I told her everything that went through my head on that strange bus, and we are still together to this day. I don't understand what happened, but I know it gave me a second chance. I hope someone can relate to this so I know I'm not going crazy. I don't know what to make of this and neither do my friends. Maybe some of you can help us understand what the hell happened. I went on a camping trip with a few of my close buddies a few weeks ago in Oregon. We hiked a few trails into the deeper part of the woods, but we remembered where we parked the car and tried to stay within a reasonable distance. We decided to settle in a clearing that was off the trail for at least a mile, a giant rock as our guide to the entrance exit of our camp. As long as we can find the rock, we know we wouldn't get lost. We thought we had a good couple of hours before the sunset. We were very wrong. There was at least an hour left of daylight last time I checked. I pulled out my phone and it was only 4.45 p.m. in the summer. Why the hell was it about to be night? My friends and I brushed it off. Maybe our phones were wrong and we need to reset them. It wasn't that dark yet, so we just put our backpacks down where we settled down. Since we could still see each other, we decided to split up to make setting up camp go faster. I collected stones for the campfire walls, Mason gathered wood, Josh would stay behind and set up tents, and Austin got ready to cook our dinner. I couldn't really find big enough rocks, so I went a little further into the woods. This part of the forest was a bit denser than the rest, and I thought I was gone for only a few minutes, but then I heard Josh calling for me. I came back to our site and our conversation went like this. I said, what's up? I heard you yell my name. Josh responded, what? I said again, you yelled my name, what did you need? Josh said, I didn't say your name at all. I just responded with, oh, okay. I went back to where I left off and grabbed a few more stones. When I got back to our pit area, I started setting them up in a circle. Mason started setting his sticks into the pit when I was finished. By now we had a campfire, our tents were just about set up, and Austin was dragging out the cooler with all of the meat we packed for the trip. We got the fire going and we were just sitting around the fire telling stories. After a while we heard some rustling in the bushes. We looked over and shined our flashlight over where we heard the noise. All we saw was a large buck running away. It was strange, but again we are in the middle of a forest. After we sat around the fire for a while, me and my friends were ready to call it a night. We got in our tents and went to bed. I woke up a few hours later hearing someone or something in our cooler. I unzipped my tent and shone my flashlight around our campsite. I looked around until I saw a shape near our supplies. It was that buck again. I could only see the right side of it, but it was just that deer getting into our cooler. Wait a minute, that's the meat cooler. Why would a deer be eating meat? Before I could think anything else, I saw the deer get up on two legs and arch its head up. It looked like it was sniffing the air for something. Then it started to scream. This scream was not normal for a deer or any animal. I quickly zipped my door back up and turned off my flashlight. I thought if whatever the hell that was didn't know I saw it, then it will go away. I texted my friends and told them to stay in their tents and to keep quiet. I hope they saw my text. I waited for what felt like hours before I decided to peek outside again. When I peeked out, I saw a red eye staring right back at me. That deer, or whatever the hell it was, was closer and stared right back at me. It wasn't right up against the tent, but that thing had a sinister smile on its face and it was smiling at me. I saw half of its face rotting off and I gagged when I smelled it from what looked to be half a yard away. I yelled for my friends to get out of their tents and run to the car. I went past the rock and made a beeline for our car. I felt like I was running forever until I saw it, and I unlocked it using my key fob. I looked at the trail and saw my friends running to the car as well. It looked like I wasn't the only one who saw it. 
We couldn't speak, even if we wanted to, no words would come out. We don't even know how to explain what we saw. That night we slept in the car with the doors locked. We didn't go back until morning to retrieve our stuff, we didn't want to run into that thing again. When we got back to the site, everything looked normal. Nothing else was taken, there were no rips in any of the tents, nothing. We still decided we wanted to get out of there ASAP, so we quickly packed everything and we left. We drove off quickly and put the forest miles behind us. We never want to go back to that place again. A few hours later that day, I got a text from Josh. He asked me, where are you guys? I looked in the mirror and I saw Josh sitting right there, but he wasn't holding his phone. I decided the best thing to do was to keep quiet for the rest of the car ride. I didn't want Josh or whatever it was to know I caught on. Me and my friends dropped Josh off at his house. He didn't say a word, but just walked into his house and shut the door. I haven't seen him come out in weeks. What did we just bring back home with us? It's been 10 years, and I still recall that night as clear as day. My parents were big into hiking through trails, and we used to go to every state park we could. I was around eight at the time and curious as ever. I was never allowed to, but sometimes I wanted to go off trail and explore on my own. I guess growing up hiking, I wasn't afraid of venturing off. Nighttime soon approached and we hunkered down for the evening. We were all exhausted, so by the time we set up our tents, we fell asleep almost instantly. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and having to go to the bathroom really bad. I didn't feel like waking either one of my parents to let them know, I thought I'll be quick so there's really no need to. I went about 20 feet away from camp to relieve myself. After washing up I just looked up at the starry night. It was cool and breezy, and you could hear the sounds of nightlife in the forest. It felt so nice out I didn't want to go back to the tent just yet. After all, I was eight and full of life and curiosity. I decided to venture around a little bit with just me and my flashlight. Nearby, I discovered a little river with some fallen trees. I sat down on a log and just sulked in that fresh night air. Not too long after, I heard footsteps crunching on leaves behind me. I stood up, turning to look, thinking my parents must have noticed I was gone and came looking for me. When I flashed my light in that direction, I was greeted by a park ranger. I don't know what it was, but I felt I was safe in his presence. You out exploring, little fellow, he said to me. I replied back, I'm out exploring. He chuckled and sat just below along the riverbank. Yeah, I've been exploring out here for a while now myself, he responded. I remember looking at his uniform and thinking it looked different from uniforms I've seen other park rangers wear. Instead of khaki shorts and a polo t-shirt, he was wearing white pants with high top scuffed up black boots. I had asked him if the uniform he was wearing was a new one because I never saw one like it. He responded that they were standard issued clothes, but he told me they didn't keep him that warm. He proceeded to show me his long dingy wool coat and said that was the only warm article of clothing he had. I was only in my pajamas and a short sleeve t-shirt and was shivering a bit. He walked over and wrapped his coat around me and said, Here, fella, this ought to do the trick. He was right. The coat warmed me right up. We talked a little more, and as curious as I was, I kept badgering him with question after question. The more we conversed, the more I realized how different his accent was, like he wasn't from the area. By this time, we had to have been talking for about an hour, if not longer. I asked him if he was camping nearby with his family and he had said he was out with his army. I remember thinking why there is an army in the woods. When I questioned him about it, he seemed lost as to why they were even in the area. Certain questions seemed to stump him like he lost his train of thought. He explained they were going to battle the British for their freedom, and at eight years old I figured it was grown-up stuff that was going on and I didn't know about it. He had mentioned George Washington and immediately light bulbs went off and I blurted out saying I know who that is and recently learned about him in my history class. He chuckled saying, yep, that's our commander and he gives orders on where to go. I looked at him puzzled and said, I thought he died a long time ago. To which he replied, no, he's still very much alive. 
Being a kid, if a grown-up tells you one thing, most of the time they're right, so I brushed it off assuming I heard wrong in school. I heard splashing in the water and flashed my light on it seeing fishing jumping up from the river. The man gasped in awe. What kind of lantern is that? I giggled saying it was just a flashlight and handed it to him. He reluctantly took it and examined it. I showed him the switch to turn it on and off and he was just baffled. How do you kill the flame and reignite it so quickly? He asked. I explained it wasn't a flame and it was powered by batteries. I looked at him puzzled and asked if he had ever seen one before. He shook his head while still examining it and clicked the switch on and off. I told him he could have it since I had another one back at camp. That's mighty kind of you, he replied. Why don't I trade you for it instead, he said. He stood and reached into his pocket pulling out a small shiny painted soldier figurine. My eyes lit up as he handed it to me. He smiled and sighed standing back up. All right, I best be on my way back to camp, he said. I stood up with him. Yeah, I should go back too. I took off the coat he had put on me. Here you'll need this to keep warm, I said. He nodded and slid it on before reaching his hand out to shake mine. I put the figurine in my pocket and I shook his hand. He began walking off and turned back. If you see any lads dressed like me, let them know camp's just up the mountain. I nodded and watched him vanish into the woods. I made my way back to the tent and went to sleep. The next morning when I woke up I remembered the figurine he gave me and searched my pockets for it. I looked everywhere and couldn't find it. I was so bummed because I wanted to show my friends when I went back to school. A few years went by and I finally pieced together the outfit the man was wearing was one of a soldier during the Revolutionary War. I couldn't believe my eight-year-old self had a talk with a ghost from then. I never told anyone about that night, but I recall it so clearly and how real he seemed. I wished I had met him when I was older because I would have had so many questions to ask. I've returned to that same spot we camped at in hopes of seeing him at night by that riverside. You hear that kids can see the dead, and maybe that's that. He could still be here, but since I'm older I'm not able to see him. If I have kids one day I may take them to that spot in hopes they meet the wondrous ghost I met. This happened to me a few summers ago while working as a ranger. It took that long for me to get my thoughts on paper. I don't want to give too many specifics. I'm afraid those guys with guns will come asking questions if I do. I lived and worked in upstate New York, and I'm fortunate enough to have miles of peaceful hiking trails all around me. It was Saturday morning and I had off, but I wanted to get out and hike a trail I hadn't been on in a while doing routine patrols. This particular trail was usually a little more crowded, so I avoided it when possible, but it had some beautiful vistas, and I was in need of some soul-soothing after this week at work. That morning I followed my usual pre-hike routine and stopped for a cup of coffee at the diner on the edge of town. I was good friends with the owner, and I always let him know when I was heading out for a day trip and what time I would be back. Hiking 101 always lets someone know when you're hitting the trail. Leaving town and heading towards the mountain, a group of three park ranger SUVs with flashing lights overtook and passed me on the road. Seeing them wasn't too unusual, after all there were lots of state parks in the vicinity. But they seemed to be in quite a rush, and I'm pretty sure they didn't have the standard National Park Service emblem painted on anywhere. I had a 45-minute drive so I put the news on to catch up on recent events. I couldn't stomach more than 10 minutes of that though. Normal politician lying through his teeth garbage, so I turned it off. As soon as I killed the radio, I heard a flopping noise coming from straight overhead. I slowed down and poked my head out of the window, looking up and sure enough there were two helicopters heading straight in the same direction. Just great missing hiker. I know it's selfish, and I admit it, but my only thought in the moment was that I hoped that they hadn't closed the trail off. I'd blown off plans with a co-worker so I could hike this trail, and if I drove all the way out here just to have to turn around, I'd be pretty pissed. Finishing the drive and parking in the small lot at the trailhead, I was relieved to see the path wasn't roped off. What's more, there was only one other car there, so I would have the trail basically all to myself. I tied my boots off, 
slipped on my hiking pack and got going. I heard the copters once or twice after I had gotten started, but didn't see them again and they sounded far off. Hopefully they found whoever was missing and quickly. I just wanted a quiet walk in the woods without any modern interruptions. I had even left my phone in the car since I didn't get service anyway. I tend to look down when I'm hiking, on the lookout for any roots or rocks that could cause me to trip, only looking up often enough to ensure I didn't walk face first into a branch. I had been going this way for a good hour and a half when I saw it. Some kind of mega-sized paw print stuck out clearly on the trail. I had seen black bears while I was out before, and though not common, it happened enough for me to want to carry bear spray in my pack. I followed the prints another few feet until they went off the trail. I'm not a hunter or tracker, so I couldn't follow them into all the brush. And besides, who wants ticks? I was a little freaked out, but had never actually heard of anyone even really being attacked. I just decided to carry my bear spray in my hand and keep trekking. I had only gone a few more miles before I decided to take another rest and grab a drink of water. The sun was high in the sky at this point, and it was getting hot. I found a big enough rock to sit on under a tree and sat down for a minute. As soon as I did, I heard shouting coming from up ahead around a bend in the trail. It sounded like a man's voice. I couldn't make out what he was saying, and I was worried that maybe he had seen the bear or something. But then I remembered the potential missing hiker and thought it must be them, or maybe somebody who found them and was yelling for help. I stashed my canteen and started off in a trot towards the voice. I kept my bear spray handy, though, just in case. I rounded the bend and was immediately hit with a wall of stench like something I had never smelled before. It was so bad that I actually stopped in my tracks trying to hold back this morning's coffee. The shouting was getting louder, heading in my direction, and now I could pick up what sounded like multiple voices. Between trying not to puke and trying to listen to the yelling, I only first caught the thing out of the corner of my eye. Something had stepped from behind a large tree onto the trail only about 20 feet away. Something massive. Turning to give it my full attention, I was... Well, I can't really describe what I felt. Terror is probably as close as I can get. Whatever this thing was, had to be at least nine feet tall. Thick, curly brown hair covered it head to toe, and its arms had to be four feet long at least. Everything about this thing screamed ape or some kind of prehistoric creature, except its face. I could make out what definitely looked like humanish features, just bigger or oversized, I don't know. I couldn't help but make eye contact. The thing was staring right at me. I was squeezing the can of bear spray so hard I thought I was going to break it. I didn't even notice the smell at this point. The creature slowly raised its arms into the air, and I braced for whatever was about to happen. It stopped with its arms stretched out, palms facing me. The kind of gesture you make to someone when you're trying to avoid a fight. Though the creature's eyes were wide and its lips seemed like they were trembling. It was afraid. Another shout came from close by up the trail. A look of terror passed the creature's face. It gave me one last look, and then bolted off the path into the undergrowth. I should have heard it crashing through the forest for long after, being how big it was, but almost as suddenly as it disappeared, I stopped hearing it. I stood there in shock. What the hell had I just witnessed? Not a minute later, three guys came running down the trail towards me and slowed down as soon as they saw me. These guys were dressed in all black, and each one carried an assault rifle. I'm not much of a gun guy, but these looked like things that would be used in a war zone. They approached me and started hammering me with questions. What was I doing here? Was I alone? What was my name? I gave them my name, my real name. Looking back, I really wish I hadn't. But when you see something like I just saw, and then three armed men appear from nowhere and begin questioning you, you're not really thinking strategically. They told me that there was bear attack nearby, and that I needed to turn around and leave the trail immediately. I had absolutely no objections. When we parted, I heard one of them say over their radio, civilian returning to the trailhead ETA 90 minutes. I made it in 60. I heard the helicopters a lot more on the way back. When I got back to my car, there was another guy sitting on a dirt bike, dressed in all black and sporting the same rifle. The other car was gone, 
and the guy didn't say a word to me. Just watched me as I got back in my Jeep and drove off. I got back home, locked the doors, and just sat on the couch for the rest of the day. I closed all the blinds too. I didn't even want to glance outside. I checked the local news for a few days afterwards and never saw any mention of a bear attack. I asked around with a few trail vets that I knew, and one or two had heard some rumors but nothing concrete. I think about that incident every single day. I remember how scared that thing was and how it could have ripped me apart if it wanted to. I wonder if it got away. Honestly, I hope it did. I had a long career as a home caregiver, home health aide or whatever they call it now. There were fewer titles when I started. I have a lot of stories to tell. Weird things happen in the homes of the sick and dying. Sometimes it felt like I was following the unexplained as I passed through the doors of a new client. That's why I was always a step behind, always reacting to the weird happenings instead of preventing them. The strangeness got there first. I was playing catch-up with the supernatural. My responsibilities included housekeeping and running errands, as well as bathing, dressing, and grooming any clients who were incapable of such on their own. I was never involved in any formal treatment or medication. My clients were either healthy enough to avoid constant medical attention or were terminal and had elected to forego any further treatment. My company called them long-term or short-term patients. Kind of cruel, but it was at least accurate. The story I want to share today is about a short-term patient, and it's about a dog. When I listed my responsibilities earlier, you'll remember that pet care was not among them. I was never asked to take care of dogs, cats, or any other family pets. By the time I arrived at a home, the client had already learned that they were in no condition to take care of an animal. That was not the case here. Upon arrival, I entered the modest single-story home with the key my company provided. I called out as instructed and loudly introduced myself. The woman of the house, I'd been told, was hard of hearing. She didn't speak much either, although that I learned after the fact. I found her in her room. She spent most of her time there, using a metal walker to alternate between her recliner and her bed. She was thin, pale, and greenish-looking. She had a head of wiry white hair that bunched up into a ball of tight curls. There was always a pair of elegant earrings in her ears. Her appearance, ultimately, was not that out of the ordinary. I know greenish-looking sounds cruel or monstrous, but I assure you that with some conditions it becomes quite normal. What was abnormal, I noticed after some time, was her earrings. I don't know where they came from. Every day, a new pair. I'd help her with her bath and her wardrobe. I'd leave to make her first meal of the day, and when I returned, earrings. I assumed the most basic of explanations. She was a distrustful old woman who didn't want her caregiver rummaging through her jewelry. Fair enough. What I could not explain was the dog. After that first day of work, I put the woman of the house to bed and prepared to leave. I'd be back in just ten hours. I was eager to get home. When I opened the front door to step onto the porch, there was a large black dog waiting for me. It ran. I only saw a muzzle and a flash of mangy dark fur. A neighborhood mutt, I assumed. Maybe my client fed the animal before their condition took a turn for the worse. I silently agreed to watch out for the dog in the future and locked up for the night. My imagination, maybe. Maybe I'd heard it walking across the porch outside and thought the sound was closer than it was. I told myself that the streak of mud in the kitchen had come from my boots and not from something else. The next day my client was noticeably more ill, bedridden from dawn to dusk, and they stayed that way for days. After laying her down early one evening as she asked to sleep at more and more frequent intervals, I resumed a few of the cleaning tasks that I'd neglected throughout the day. This time I saw it, unmistakably inside, waiting for me at the end of the hallway. It looked like a retriever, except for the matted black hair. The coat was short and curly, the snout long and eyes bright. I yelled and stepped toward it. Yet again, it fled. I tried to chase the animal to see how it was sneaking in and out of the house, 
but as soon as I reached the end of the hallway, it was gone. Muddy tracks carved a path through the house, but ultimately faded into nothing. I said it earlier, I was playing catch-up. Always one step behind. I called my company and asked about the dog. I contacted a few distant family members of my client and asked around the neighborhood. No one knew the origins of this animal. Animal control went through the house that week and verified that there were no visible entrances for any animal, let alone an adult dog, to sneak through. Since the last sighting, though, the lady of the house had gotten worse. She didn't leave the bed anymore. I thought my time with her was coming to an end. Even if it was, I cut our time even shorter. One night I entered her room and the dog was on her chest. I saw it. I know it was there. I saw it and as the light from the hallway touched its body, it vanished. I stood in shock, staring at my sleeping client under her sheets. Staring at the muddy paw prints on her blanket, I requested a transfer the next day. I don't know what ultimately happened to that woman. Maybe that makes this story less rewarding than it could be. But taking care of pets wasn't in my job description, and neither was chasing ghosts around a house. I chose to get out of there, and because of that, I have this and many other stories to tell. You can tell me if I made the wrong call. What I'd really like to know, however, is if anyone else has seen that dog, 